What I'm interested in primarily is um, constructing moral theories or thinking about how to go about constructing moral theories. Why do we go about theorizing at all? Well, there are features of the world that we find interesting or perplexing or puzzling, and uh, we want to understand them. We want to be able to explain them to ourselves and to others. And maybe one way to get a handle of this is to think about theorizing in, in, in the sciences or in the natural world. So we may, uh, we may recognize that uh, certain objects fall if we let them go. You know, Newton saw the apple fall from the tree. And you might be perplexed about why objects fall to the ground. Well, then you have all these data. You know that apples fall and pens fall and, and cups of coffee fall and everything you know, falls if you let it go. Well, why is that? You might want to construct a theory about this. So Newton had a theory and he has a story about gravitation and he constructed laws or he, he developed laws that are supposed to explain the facts that he was observing. So these are natural phenomena. There are other phenomena. There are phenomena that we describe as moral phenomena. So for example, uh, if Joe is at the mall and Joe uh, uh, sees a pair of shoes he really wants. And he looks in his wallet and he realizes he forgot his wallet at home. Right? So now uh, he's thinking, what am I to do? I want these shoes, I don't have money. And then he notices you know, an elderly man at the ATM. Right? And he notices that the elderly man puts his wallet on the side and he realizes that he can grab the wallet. Suppose he goes ahead and he grabs the wallet and buys his shoes. And let's also assume that Joe is actually wealthy and this elderly man is not. I think many of us will intuitively uh, think that what Joe is doing is terribly wrong. And so here's, here's something wrong that Joe has done. Well, why is this wrong? Uh, in much the same way that we ask, why does the apple fall? We might want to know, what, why is Joe's action of stealing the old man's wallet, why is that wrong? And we want a theory that would explain this to us. So there are many differences, of course, between theorizing about the natural world and theorizing about morality. So one uh, feature that we find in, uh, in, in investigations in physics and when people theorize about the natural world, they do experiments, right? And they measure stuff. In ethics, uh, materials are quite different. So we can engage in thought experiments, we can think about uh, various actions, and we can try to determine whether these actions are right or wrong. And then we want a theory that will explain our judgments about those situations. So we may use thought experiments more so than we use actually ex actual experiments and measurements. So we can, you know, I just made up this story about Joe. We can make up other stories, and this is actually a, a tool that moral philosophers use quite a lot, thought experiments. So interestingly, uh, moral philosophers have not been quite as successful as, uh, as Newton or other scientists. So one feature of Newton's theory is that he managed to identify a law, a law of nature. A law of nature is a statement that presumably has no exceptions. Now Newton is actually an interesting case because uh, contemporary physics tells us that Newton was actually wrong. So actually these laws are not right, they're false. Uh, but for the sake of example, let's use them as if they're right. Or we can talk about Einstein's uh, 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 theory if we prefer. One feature of laws of nature is that if we find an instance where they don't apply or things behave not in accordance with the, with the formulated laws, then that's a serious problem. Uh, either we have to give up the laws or we have to give up our observations. Something went wrong. Right? It can't, if I drop an apple and it stays hanging in the air, that's a problem. In ethics, well, again, we don't have experiments and measurements in this way, but we have theories or we try to construct theories. And these theories sometimes tell us something about various cases. And sometimes the theories give verdicts that seem wrong to us or unacceptable to us. So for example, if we talked about Joe and the shoes just a, while, just a minute ago, if a theory would give us the result that Joe's action is okay, morally permissible, that's fine, it's a virtuous action, that would be a problem. We, we would think that's a mistake, this theory is incorrect. And moral philosophers uh, for a while have thought, either explicitly or implicitly, uh, that it would be nice if we could formulate something like laws of ethics. Right? It would be nice if we can have a statement uh, that has no exceptions, that tells us the verdict about brightness and wrongness of actions with no exception. In much the same way that Newton's laws are supposed to hold without exceptions. So again, if we have this apple floating in the air, that's a problem for Newton's theory. Um, so the thought is, let's formulate the laws of ethics, if you will. Most moral theories that have been proposed in the past 200 years, and even probably going further back, have been of this kind. So for example, uh, consequentialist theories are of the form you know, an action is morally right if and only if it brings about the best consequences. Uh, well, this tells you something about all and only morally right actions. They all have this feature that they bring about the best consequences. 
And if you find an exception, that's a problem for this principle. The principle either has to go or our judgment has to go. In much the same way that if you find a floating apple, right? Either this, you know, maybe maybe it's a helium apple. It's not really an apple, or maybe it's, a, or maybe the laws are mistaken. Maybe it's not a law of nature that uh, objects, massive objects, attract each other. Right. So consequentialist theories have been around for a while now, and there are several notorious problems for these views. Now, this is not to say that there aren't smart people who think these are correct theories. There are very smart people who think that we got it more or less right. But if you look at the philosophical community, those who engage in moral theorizing, uh, many people are of the view that these uh, theories are incorrect. We can give examples of actions that either bring about the best consequences and seem pretty clearly morally wrong, or actions that don't bring about the best consequences and seem to be right. right so suppose you have, a, you have a child, and your child is in desperate need of, of uh, some medical treatment, unfortunately. And uh, you just have enough money to pay for this treatment. So you can save your child. Just as you enter the hospital, you find out that there are two other children who need certain treatments, and they would die unless they get these treatments. And it turns out their treatment is a bit less expensive than your own child's treatment. And you have a choice between you know, paying for your child's treatment or paying for these two uh, um, children that you don't know. So you have a choice between saving the lives of two people or saving the life of your child. It may seem as though saving the lives of two people would bring about better consequences than saving the life of one child. Uh, nevertheless, many of us think that under these conditions, it's morally right to pay for your child's treatment. In fact, it would be morally wrong not to do so. So what we find in the literature in ethics over the past uh, 200 years or so is that people propose an, a moral law, right, a principle of rightness. And then some other smart people find problems for these principles, something like the floating apple we've been imagining. So they find cases like the one I described. So here's a principle, and here's a case where it seems to get it wrong. Now, if your view is that, much like in the case of the laws of nature, if we find a, an instance where the law doesn't apply, that's a problem for the law. Then if we find a case where the principle doesn't apply, that's a problem for the principle, then the, these theories are either false or at best very problematic. So one thing we can do as moral philosophers, we can continue doing the same thing. We can try and tweak with those principles until we manage to get them to a point where they get the right results and you know, we reach a consensus and we've solved the moral problem, if you will. In a way, that's what scientists do, right? So uh, we found problems, we. Uh, scientists found problems for Newton's uh, laws and so a new theory came about and now we have Einstein's theory and then there are problems for that and uh, scientists are looking for a new theory or a theory that would unify quantum mechanics and, and theory of relativity or whatnot. In a way, we can keep on doing the same thing in ethics, and we can hope that eventually we'll have our Einstein who will solve all the moral problems for us by way of formulating an exceptionist principle. And that's, that's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly open to the possibility that someone much smarter than you know, all the great minds that have been engaged in ethics so far will come along and solve the moral problem. But there is a possibility, and it, it's a possibility. I'm not claiming that it's a fact of the matter, but it's possible that ethics is different from science in some important ways. And it's possible that the best way to approach moral theorizing is not by trying to find those laws of ethics, those exceptionalist principles. But maybe there is some other way to engage in moral theorizing. And what I've been interested in is to try to come up with a way of engaging in moral theorizing that is explaining those facts about rightness and wrongness, like Joe's the wrongness of Joe's action, right? Why is it wrong for Joe to steal the wallet from the old man to buy the shoes he really wants? Uh, not by identifying a law of ethics, some principle that tells us that every action that has a certain feature is wrong, and then Joe's action has this feature, and so it's wrong, but some, but some other way. So how might we do that? As far as engaging with the philosophical community, first, the first step, I think, is to get people, or my colleagues, to appreciate the fact that we can do so without finding and formulating uh, what we've been calling uh, moral laws or moral principles. There are very interesting debates in moral theorizing about whether there are uh, actions that are right and wrong. Maybe this is something that we project onto the world. Maybe there are no such facts in the world. Maybe there's something radically different uh, about morality, say, from we've been talking about physics. So there is a fact, there is an apple here, and I let it go, it falls, that's a fact. That Joe's action is wrong, some people think, is not a fact. Maybe it's something that I project onto Joe's action. Uh, maybe it's something that our community uh, uh, disapproves of. 
So there are debates about whether there are moral facts in the first place. Uh, the debate over the nature of moral theorizing is mostly interesting to those of us who think that there are moral facts. So it is a fact, we may assume for the sake of discussion, that Joe's act of, of stealing the wallet uh, to buy his coveted shoes is morally wrong. If it's a fact, what explains this fact? Why, why spend time philosophizing? Uh, it's a very tricky question. Uh, specifically about ethics, we may have some practical incentive to do so. So we talked about Joe's, Joe's case, right? Joe sees this wallet, he wants the shoes, he steals the wallet and gets the shoes. It's obvious to us that this action is, is wrong. Uh, for most of us, there is no doubt about this, at least in, in, uh, uh, in some mindsets, right? Unless we walk into a philosophy classroom and start in, uh, considering various other options, it seems to us pretty clear that this is wrong. But there are many difficult situations, ones that we're not so sure about. So um, there are many controversial issues, say, for example, euthanasia. Well, we may have opinions, but I think our confidence in our judgment about this case is going to be quite different for, from our confidence in the Joe case. Now, these are difficult cases, and we might hope that having a theory about rightness and wrongness may help us uh, reach more uh, defensible or justifiable judgments about difficult cases. The project I'm interested in is in fact one that says we don't need to find this golden rule out there. We don't need to find the law of ethics to explain this. And then once we understand how we go about explaining this, maybe we'll be in a better position, maybe, and this is very tentative, maybe we'll be in a better position to make uh, correct moral judgments in, in new situations and difficult situations.